Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Isabella Rowan, and I am the program coordinator here at Delray Beach Public Library. And it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the second program in our Florida Foodway series. Florida Foodways, the intersection of food and culture, is a four-part series of programs about Florida and food. And who doesn't love Florida? And who doesn't love food? Right? That's why we're all here. Um, funding for this series was provided by a community grant from Whole Foods Market Delray. Each program in this series focuses on a different aspect of Florida culinary history. Next week, which will be our third program, at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday, April 28th, we will explore the African influences on Florida cuisine with Diane M. Spivey, an author and culinary historian who has devoted more than 40 years to the study and recording of African-American food traditions and cooking. The fourth and final program in this series takes place at 7 p.m. on Tuesday, May 4th. Margaret Norman, a specialist in Southern Jewish history and foodways, will join us on Zoom from Birmingham, Alabama, and will take us on an historical tour of Florida Jewish foodways. These programs are all free, but registration is required, and you can go to delraylibrary.org to register. Um, tonight, I am thrilled to introduce to you Chef Norman Van Aken. The nearly lifelong Florida resident is an award-winning chef, author, radio host, and restaurateur. For tonight's program, first he will demonstrate his featured dish, and then we will dive into a great conversation about his life as a chef and his love affair with Florida cuisine. But before I turn it over to Chef, I want to read a small bit about him from an article that was published in Smithsonian Magazine. The title of the article is Why We Have Norman Van Aken to Thank for the Way We Dine Out Today. And the journalist writes, she says, before the celebrity, the celebrity chef craze and before the start of Food Network, Van Aken was starting a revolution. He was doing something unheard of at the time, taking local ethnic flavors and merging them together at restaurants where he worked. Wolfgang Puck has called him a true pioneer of the American food movement in the 80s. Mario Batali has said the American culinary landscape would not be the same without his vision. And the late James Beard winning chef and restaurateur Charlie Trotter named Van Aken the Walt Whitman of American cuisine. So here he is from the heart of his home, his very own kitchen, Chef Norman Van Aken. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Those are uh, those are two strong words, and I, I I have a lot to live up to, I guess. But um, <laughs> welcome everybody. I'm pleased that you've signed up for this series. Um, I've had the pleasure of um, being on one of the the, uh, the stages with Gary Mormino, and uh, that was an amazing opportunity. And so um, I, I missed that one, but I surely would hope to uh, to be there for the rest of these these great speakers. Um, I'm walking over so I can uh, get to my kitchen and the setup that I've got going over here. So for a little minute, I'm going to go ahead and fasten my phone into a, a rack so that you can look at um, what I'm going to be cooking for you tonight. And before I do that little switch, I'll tell you that we're doing pan-cooked Florida shrimp with caramelized sweet plantain, moros y cristianos, a citrus butter sauce with some black beans and a little bit of zest of orange. So just give me a minute while I get this camera on the uh, burner and we'll, I'll be back to you. Okay. Can we see? Yes, we can. Excellent. Okay. So skill is right here in front of me. And what I have over here is what we call the mise en place and the French terminology of, of cooking in a kitchen. And so obviously we need to have the Florida shrimp. These particular shrimp are sustainable shrimp from a company called Homegrown Shrimp USA. And, um, and they have just started harvesting their shrimp down in Homestead. And so they have, um, they have brought this over and, and donated it for our class tonight. So what I'm gonna do is take um, some annatto oil that I made today. And annatto oil 
is made by steeping an auto seeds for a period of, let's say, 10, 15 minutes in some oil. And what we ended up with is we end up with a beautiful hue to our shrimp with a very light flavor. It's, it's like using saffron, but it's not as expensive for sure, but it's also um, kind of more nuanced as far as uh, flavors go. Um, here's the shrimp, some salt, some freshly ground black pepper, And these shrimp are completely peeled. Sometimes for shrimp, I leave the tail on um, so people can kind of pick them up. But today, I, um, my fabulous chef to cuisine, Janet Van Aken, peeled them for me. So we've got some extra virgin olive oil. And I'm going to go ahead and um, put a little bit of garlic. Minced garlic into the pan and some shallots into the pan. Always start laying down flavors like this. So you can see that the garlic and the shallots are already sizzling. And we don't want to get too far. We don't want to burn the garlic. So we just kind of give it a ride like so. Once it gets fragrant, and once it is fragrant, we can go ahead and put our shrimp in. If you're a, a young or novice cook, shrimp are some of the most simple things to cook. They're very forgiving, I would say. So we're just stirring them around, getting the shrimp to know the shallots and garlic. I bet it smells Everything good. will be cooked in this pan. We're going to have to go into the oven for any reason today. Now, you'll see in a minute that um, I'll be, when I plate this dish, which will be about three or four minutes from now, um, you're going to see a, a butter sauce that's going to go on the base of the plate. And I made that sauce just before the class today, the, the Zoom meeting today. Um, butter sauces are easy to make, but they're not something that we often make in a home. But um, it's certainly something that we make often in the restaurant world. I'll let that sizzle for a few minutes, for a few moments more. I can hear, I can hear fine. So if anybody's got a question while I'm doing this, I can take a question. How do you know when they're done? I'm a novice cook. <laughs> color. Like you can see that's the little pink there. We, we don't want that. And so what I like to do is, uh, is go ahead and set them on the edges because that's the thickest part of the shrimp where that, where that is right there. So if I can get this down, then I'm going to be able to get the shrimp cooked completely through. Um, add a little bit of white wine to the, uh, to the dish. Chef, we have a question. Um, from Cindy, she is asking if you are serving this dish as a first course, how many shrimp per person? Okay, because that white one there, right as you were asking that question, I'm going to have to ask you to repeat that. If you are serving this dish as a first course, how many shrimp per person? Um, you know, that's a great question. Um, it would really depend on if I was going to be doing, let's say, one appetizer and one entree and maybe a dessert. For that, in that case, I'd probably serve depending on the size of the shrimp, I'd probably serve like four shrimp. But if I was serving like a multi-course dinner, like four or five courses, I'd probably be serving three shrimp. It always depends on that. Now, we rarely have a situation where we're serving five courses in a home cook situation. So um, I think around four will probably be good. Okay, so our shrimp are now nicely cooked. I'm going to um, plate the dish. So I'm gonna switch things around for a moment. And I'm gonna move in here with our plate. And then I'm gonna go retrieve the aforementioned butter sauce, as well as one or two other little tricks up my sleeve. 
And now here in this bowl is the butter sauce. And this is a citrus butter sauce. And it's made by taking freshly juiced orange. And I actually use a combination of fresh orange juice and mandarin orange juice today. And then you reduce that with some champagne vinegar and some shallots. And then when all of the citrus juice and vinegar have reduced, you add a touch of heavy cream and then you beat in butter. Yum. So that's the citrus butter sauce. Is and it warm? It's warm, yes. And it would break if it weren't warm. Ah. This is a very, it shows the Cuban side of what, what I love. And Cuban flavors were the first untraditional for me flavors because I grew up in Illinois. But um, this is Moros y Cristianos, the Moors and the Christians. And um, this is really the starch component of the dish. So is that rice and beans? Mm-hmm. Okay. Really homey, very, very homey. And oh, so much of what I fell in love with when I first got to Key West and um, was beginning to explore all kinds of the Caribbean flavors. That's caramelized plantain. Oh, Sue, and then, we have another question. Sue is asking, what did you mix the shrimp with prior to cooking? Sure, salt, pepper, and annatto oil. That's all for this particular dish. Those are some little um, tomatoes. I love to go down to the farms in, in Redlands uh, and I'm going there Saturday because it's one of the last weekends that we can go and, and get um, the produce because the summer comes and it's just too hot. Mm -hmm. um, black beans, one of the most emblematic of all the ingredients of Florida um, are added to there because you won't really see the black beans so clearly here, but against the butter sauce, you can. Um, so the tomatoes I normally use are the ones from Tina's Pride. So we've got uh, our Moros of Cristianos. We've got our butter sauce. We've got, um, we got to get the shrimp. Okay, so I have more shrimp in the pan that I'm gonna put on the plate. So, because I don't want to lose the sort of clarity of the plate, the beauty of the plate. So like I said, four for the four for the first course of the although this is an entree set up here. This is more than in the old days, I probably would have treated this like an appetizer. So we've got um, the citrus butter sauce, caramelized plantain, the, uh, the shrimp, of course, some tomatoes that I dress with a little bit of salt and sherry vinegar, and then the black beans here. And then of course, we're in Florida, so oranges are something that we treasure. So a little zest of orange for some brightness and color against the uh, Moros and Cristianos. And this is a very nice Florida dish. I hope you're enjoying it. So there we go. Wish we could smell it and taste it. <laughs> I hear you. It's a frustrating. Oh, almost forgot. This is a little bit of what's called pimenton which shows our Spanish uh, ancestry to our cuisine as well, which is a smoked paprika from Spain, which I just put into that little gizmo there, which is kind of fun. See, there's the, there's the spice and you just have that like that. Now these shrimp came um, shell on, as I said. And so what I, what I do is I, um, I save the shells. So when I, when I get the shrimp, these are both head on and, and uh, shell on. So that's what these little, the antennas are there. We take these and if we're not using them right away, we'll put them in the freezer, but I will make sauces and court bouillons or shrimp boil for a very simple way of, of expressing that. So we have the shrimp shells. Again, go into the freezer if you're not gonna use them right away. So there we are. I'm going to uh, bring this uh, camera stand over to the table so we can talk a little bit. So can you, give me a quick bit. Before you do that, can you hold the dish up a little bit closer to the camera so we can get a close up? By all means. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Yum. <laughs> this, this is a dish that I probably would have served at Louis' backyard 
in Key West in the late 1980s. This is very, this is what I really was starting to move toward understanding um, how to how to really we'll get into this when we talk, but more into the fusion between French technique and Caribbean produce. This is what I really started to do a lot with. And I still, I still do. All right. So I'm going to take uh, the camera over to the, this other area and train it on me so we can chat. Oh my God. What a great kitchen. And look at his library. Oh my (laughs) gosh. (laughs) As a librarian. Wow. It started with one book, right? Uh, yep. It started with one book. And I can tell you what the name of that book was as soon as I figure this part out. <laughs> um, it was um, The Theory and Practice of Good Cooking by James Beard. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of shamed into buying that book. I was asking so many questions at my job that the sous chef said, why don't you read? And I was like stung <laughs> by that remark. And I went, I read. I read Dostoevsky. I read <laughs> these like no, I mean, cookbooks, cookbooks. And I was like, oh, like who's, you know, like I didn't really didn't want to give him the benefit of the, of me um, being schooled by him because he was younger than me. And he said, well, try James Beard. And so that afternoon I left uh, work and I don't even know how I had the ability to do this, but I bought the book, which must have cost twenty dollars, which was pretty much money to me at that point in time. Mm-hmm. And uh, Theory and Practice of Good Cooking was the book that I bought and it's over my desk in my office still. And it, because I never did go to cooking school, um, books be, books became my way out. You know, I sometimes call it like, you know, somebody who goes to jail and has to learn the law. For me, I didn't want to be a line cook when I was 50. and I And I understood on some level that if I could teach myself and teaching yourself is not only in books, it's by talking to people and, and, and absorbing the lessons from people from all walks of life. Then I had a chance to, um, to ascend to a chef's level. And that's eventually took a few years, but eventually it's what happened. Wow. I love it. And it all started, I mean, really with a book, right. That helped you move on up the chain of of things. That's a great library story. <laughs> it is. Love I've it. loved, I've loved books all my life. I you know, my mom was great. Uh, at, and my grandmother and the lady who lived next door, who was, we called auntie. So they always were pressing books into my hands. And I was, I would go anywhere in any situation, climbing up trees, uh, was one of my favorite places to go read in Illinois when I was a little boy growing up. And, um, you know, I still, I mean, if I flip this camera around right now on this table, you'd see 12 books stacked up on the other end of this table of the books that we just bought in the last month and haven't had a chance to get into yet. So we continue to open up, um, our minds and our vistas with, um, with books. Love it. I love it. Thank you for that. So I have, I have some questions for you, and I imagine that the audience will have some questions too. But let's start off with um, you as a kid. So did the child, Norman, know that he wanted to be a chef? Was that something that you aspired to when you were, when you were young? I had no, no idea, nor did I even in, until a later. I mean, uh, jumping forward, I, my first cooking job started when I was 21. I cooked for six years before I ever saw that this was the life that I was going to be doing for the rest of my working days, because the places that I cooked at in the beginning weren't aspirational places. They were a way to make money. They were just, you know, I mean, they weren't bad places, but there wasn't that incredible intensity that I was looking for that I thought I would find in, um, writing songs or um, being in a band or playwright or something like that. That's where I really, my head was really at. I was around the restaurant business because my mom was um, in the restaurant business. When my mother and father divorced, my mom went back to the restaurant business and um, was a waitress when she was still young. And then she became a manager. And so the restaurant world was always part of my, the, you know, the auditory aspect of growing up. Mm-hmm. She talked about the restaurant um, my sisters were both waitresses where she worked. I didn't work in the restaurant until much later. Occasionally I'd be dragged in to wash dishes because somebody didn't show up, but I didn't, I didn't 
cook in a restaurant till later, 21 years old. And that was because I had um, exhausted other job opportunities, <laughs> including hot tar, hot tar roofing, carnival, uh, factory work. I worked in Ball Brothers plant where I swept up broken glass every day. And, and it was really, um, it was really not sure what I was going to do. But then I got a job by answering an ad for a, um, a short order cook. And for the first time in my life, I went to work with, with great joy, anticipation. I loved it. And that was at your, in your child home state of Illinois, right? Yep. That's where Yeah, you that was my, my, that was the last, that was the first cooking job. And it was the, and it was right after that, that um, I just said, I'm going back to Key West because I had visited Key West uh, for about a month, two years preceding to that. And I, and I wanted so badly to get back to Florida. So before, and yeah, we're going to talk about your time in Key West, but before that, um, getting back to the diner where you started, uh, is that diner still around? No, not, in, not only in my dreams and my memory, but okay. no. Okay. Because okay. I thought maybe you would be a big celebrity for them and you know, they'd have your picture on the wall and all that stuff, but they're not there anymore. Well, that's too bad. <laughs> so, oh, well. you, <laughs> so you left the diner, you went you, and you went down to, to Key West um, so yep. when was that? And, and like, what was it like cooking there? Like, what did you do when you got there? Yeah. Um, I first visited Key West in 71. Um, an older, um, my best friend's older brother had gone down there and it was such like, where did he go? Where's Key West? We, it was like such an unusual idea. And then at the end of a, a very long party in Champaign-Urbana, some friends said, yeah, we'll go to Key West with you. When do you want to go? I said, tonight. We all drove. We all that night went to Key West. And as like I said, I fell in love with it. But it took a little bit. Um, once I'd worked at the diner for six months, I'd saved up the massive amount of $300 <laughs> and felt I was now bankrolled and I could go to Key West and did. That was 73. I got a job um, shortly after that in an all night diner, an all night barbecue place called the Midget Bar and Grill. There was no short statured individual working there. The midget, I think, was named for the kitchen because to open the stove door, you had to step out into the hallway. That's how small the kitchen was. Wow. The major part of the cooking happened in an outdoor area, the barbecue area. And as I said, I think I said it was open 24 hours. There was a large banyan tree that um, was the center of that restaurant. There were no walls on the restaurant, just a corrugated tin roof. And um Guitar players and, and harmonica players would play um, sometimes at night. And one of the early musicians back in 73 was Jimmy Buffett, who had not made his reputation nationally yet. And nobody really knew the, knew who, him by name. I mean, he was starting to make a reputation. But that was my first job cooking in Key West. Wow. I worked the, I worked the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. Oh, gosh. Yeah, wow. it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> so what what was it that made you decide to focus so clearly on Florida in your cooking? Yeah, I you know it's about I um I my mom and dad when they were together, um, there was a beautiful stretch of time where every Christmas they brought me and my two sisters to Miami Beach. And I I thought of Florida as just a heaven on earth place to, to leave the winter of Illinois and go down and, and, and be able to go swimming in the swimming pool at the hotel or the ocean and smell um, the flowers and the different foods. And, and even the suntan lotion just seemed so exotic to me. I just was so wrapped up in the spell of that magic that uh, Florida, Florida really got me from the, from a very young age, but then um I, I, I cooked for a while, like I said, before I realized that the artistry that I saw in, in writing could be available to me in cooking. And so that was around 78 and 79. I was working at a hotel restaurant at the Pier House at the very end of Duval Street. And um, the owner was a great eccentric man named David Wachowski, God bless him, God rest his soul. He died, I think at 99 years old, not too long ago. David um, understood that it didn't have to be continental food um, to be considered um, 
I don't know, alluring and, and have a cachet to it. He, he admired some of the restaurants in America, like the Coach House in New York City, that served some of the regional fare, like black bean soup. He, mm-hmm. he actually flew up uh, to New York to bring some friends, key lime pie, he carried it on his lap in a plane. And, and, he, and he was he hired people who were some of the first graduates of the Culinary Institute of America. So when I got to that kitchen, I was around people who were often younger than me that knew so much more than me. And it it just kind of created um, a real de- desire for me to learn what they knew. And um, and being in Key West, I think uh, it, it didn't suffer from what, you know, what I might call continental cuisine disease, where you know, everything was like Maine lobster or Dover sole. People people enjoyed the local fish and enjoyed the um, the flavors of the Caribbean. And so it was such a good break for me to be there and be fostered in that in that um, bohemian place, but a very natural place for the fla- flavors of Florida to come forth. Right. I think if I had not gone to Key West and just had ended up in Miami, I might have been much more caught up in French and Italian cuisine um, rather than taking on what I came to call new world cuisine. Right. Which leads me to the next question. So thank you for that. So you're known as the father of new world cuisine. What is the philosophy behind that? The um, it, things really began to shift in America in the mid seventies. We, most of us that were in kitchens um, pretty much were under the influence of European um how to you know, the chefs were often French uh, or French trained and so we didn't really have an American spirit yet in our food but I think coincidentally with the um, the bicentennial that happened in 76 and um, things like that there became a, an appreciation awareness of the American spirit the American art form um, and regional American cuisine began to blossom. The California food movement, probably most famously with chefs like uh, Alice Waters, Jeremiah Tower, Wolfgang Puck, we began to see and read the magazines of the day um, wherever we were. I mean, I couldn't afford to travel anywhere, but at least, this is so long before the internet, but at least we could travel through the magazines in the sense of learning what was going on in the regional cuisine of California and then New Orleans and then the American Southwest. And so I was I was excited by the idea that the American spirit could mean that we could we could satisfy our American muse and um, come up with things that spoke to where we were from or where we were living, at least if not from. And so living and working in Key West at the very very clearly, it was while I was working at Louis Backyard in 1985 that I um, I was I had been to Napa Valley and was in love with it. But I, I I kind of went, you know what? I could either I should go to Napa Valley and I should cook in Napa Valley. It's so great out there with the wine and everything else. And then I thought, but but other people are doing that, and who is doing something for Florida? And I was, I was, uh, you know, I kind of used Robert Mondavi as a little bit of a, as a, as a, 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 a teacher in the sense that he he'd come from, he'd learned the European craft, especially in Italy, but he decided that California was where he wanted to grow his, uh, his grapes that would make his wine. And I decided um, that Key West was where I really needed to hitch my wagon to that. And because that's where I lived and mm-hmm. I did that. And I saw for a period of time, I put away all the books. I put away all the extra extraneous, well, extra outside influences for a while and just completely, you know, put blinders on myself and said, no, put all those other books away. It's great that people cook Italian and Mediterranean or French or Japanese or Chinese. It's fantastic. But you're placed on this earth for a specific reason. And that reason is to bring up the flavors of where you are at and where you are living. And so um, because there were not books on that, almost without fail, there were very, very few books. I began to talk to the locals, go to the to little restaurants in Key West, you know, the places where it was like a counter and I'd sit on a stool and ask, you know, the cop who was sitting next to me, what he was having in his bowl. Or I'd ask the waitress who sometimes didn't 
uh, didn't speak any more English than I spoke Spanish um, and asked her, you know, what is Ropa Vieja? What is Caldo Gallego? And um, how do I make this? And how do I make that? And they, they, they put up with all my questions. They were good natured about that. And so I had a little notepad and I was taking all these notes down. And then I would go to the little grocery stores like Fosto's um, in Key West. And I scour the aisles and look for products that were Spanish, things I didn't know what they were. Fideo noodles. I remember in the pasta section seeing Fideo noodles. I'm like, what is that? And fortunately, there was a book called Catalan Cuisine by a person who's become my friend named Coleman Andrews, who's the originator of Savour Magazine, among other things in his life. Um, so I was able to, that book was instructive to me. Penelope Casas book, The Foods and Wines of Spain, was an early teacher for me. Elizabeth Lambert Ortiz's book, The Complete Book of Caribbean Cooking, was an early book for me. So I just, I just, I just, uh, you know, I surrounded myself with all of that. And I, and I was writing the menus every single day. I mean, I'd create all, I'd create all these specials around whatever I was learning, what I, whatever I thought people would want to taste too. And um, so that took me through the end of the eighties and into the nineties until, and then I moved to Miami. And that's, and that's where all the fusion was taking place and all of your creativity. It sounds like it was such a great time in your life. Did you try all of these recipes and these ideas at home first before you launched them in the restaurants or did you just say uh the hell with it and just do it <laughs> <laughs> well you know i mean it's like that um it's like that ten thousand hours thing um when you do something for such a long period of time like the musicians i think the beatles were written about most famously what was it malcolm uh who wrote that book Gladwell, yeah, yes. Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, when they when you play, you played. They call it playing when it's a band. They call it working when you're in a kitchen. But for me, it was a form of play too. But when you're in the kitchen for that many years, you have the ability to look at the ingredients and taste them in your mind. Uh, you're not always going to come up with a hit. No, there's there's not that. But very rarely would anybody ever have the time to do all of that testing tasting in a in a home kitchen there was a there was a, a stretch of time where i was between jobs as they say which coincided with me having a contract to write what i would be my third cookbook and that cookbook um was was tested all at home but tremendous amount of work to do that in that way mm -hmm. no I, I i i could pretty much you know i can i can look at somebody else's recipes and read the recipe and go, I know what this is going to taste like almost for sure. And then I'll go from there. Wow. So speaking of writing, so you have authored six cookbooks and a memoir. Right. Do you have a picture of them? Someone is asking in the chat if you have a picture of all your books or if you can show us all your books. Oh can, yeah. Are you I mean, able to do that? We, we, we don't we, have them all on our shelf here, sadly. Um, we had, I have we did have them. your memoir, but it's missing in the mist. Someone absconded with it. So, oh my gosh! Yeah, here's this, here, here's here's the stack of books. Oh, sweet! I know yeah. that we recently ordered the bottom one, Norman Van Aken's Florida Kitchen, but it's currently checked out. And that's the one that's the most recent one I've written. This one here, where I look like my son almost. Uh, this is the first one I wrote during. Uh, my time at Louis backyard. This is the memoir, and um, I'm awfully, I'm awfully happy to see what Tony Bourdain wrote on the cover, for the cover of the book right there. Mm -hmm. Tony was an incredible person, as almost everybody on the planet knows, and yes. um, he had me on his television show in Key West, and also he came out of Key West, and we we hung out there, and then we also went to uh, an island off the coast of Venezuela. Um, the the this is what we sometimes call is the big book. This was the book that really, um, really kind of gave me the opportunity to switch from uh, the kind of combination of the European dishes that I was learning uh, at first and moving more wholesale into New World Cuisine. That's why the title of that book is New World Cuisine. This is New World Kitchen. And this book, although more slim in size, took me four years to write because it covers approximately 38 countries. And it was 
it is a book on all of, I touch every country, almost without exception of South America and Central America and the Caribbean. So it was a gigantic learning curve for me. And it, it gave me an enormous uh, opportunity to learn so much more about the diversity of South America and my immense respect for the cuisine of South America was certainly caused by that book. This book, certainly the most, I'd say labor of love, this one flowed very quickly. I shared the, uh, the author duties with our son, Justin Van Aken, and he wrote the book with me and he wrote the stories with me. And so uh, we went on book tour together after the book came out. And this is a, uh, this is a very emotional book because, you know, my wife, Jan, and I have been together since that first diner. Uh, our son was born in Key West. Jan and I lived in Key West for over 20 years. And um, we still love to go back to Key West uh, and, and relive and see the things again. Then this book, the last book that I've written thus far, um, this book is, was my, my, my aspiration for this was to do the totality of Florida. I'd written about... Key West, I had written about Miami with this book. I wanted to get more of a, give more of a sense of, to people of the totality of Florida. Mm-hmm. We'd operated our restaurant Norman's at the Ritz Carlton in Orlando for 15 years when I wrote this book. So I had a lot of time in central Florida, traveled to uh, Northern Florida. Um, and this book is, you know, me, me showing the love of the entire state. So that's fabulous. <laughs> so do you, do you love writing as much as you love cooking? Yeah, I do. Um, I did. I wanted to be a writer when I was young. I mean, if somebody would ask me, what do you want to be when I was 20? I would have said, I want to be a writer, but I just, I guess, I think I was just too shy to write a manuscript and turn it in and turn it in and have them say, ah, we're not going to publish that. I, so I <laughs> guess I, I felt I was, it was kind of like, easier in some ways for me just to grind it out in the kitchens for years. But eventually the writing became as important and, um, and I'm able to satisfy a great, a great amount of the love of that through um, working on my radio show, Word on Food, which airs every Saturday morning on the NPR station WLRN out of Miami, but it does reach as far as West Palm Beach from where I understand. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What, yeah. time, what time is that on? It's on just after 8.30 in the morning, um, 91.3 and 91.5, but you can always access it on the WLRN website. Right. Um, if you go to their web- website and go to radio, a word on food, you'll see um, the most recent show, but you'll also see like, you know, 20 shows before that. I've written 400 plus shows now. Wow. Speaking, and do you have any books in the works? Any more books that you're working on? Not working any books right now. I've kind of put all of our efforts toward what is coming up next, which will be the um, Cooking with Norman, which is it came out of, you know, the pandemic and all the videos I've been doing with Instagram. Um, I had opened up a cooking school in Miami, but uh, with all the changes, uh, you know, I couldn't be, you know, meeting people right in person anymore. So um, just switching gears and... Um, if you if were able to turn this camera around and see into the kitchen, you'd see uh, cameras that one that hovers over the um, the stove, like the cook, cooking uh, element, like we did before. Another one that hangs over the stove, and then there'll be the laptop which shows me. And so people will be able to sign up by going to my website, normanvanaken.com, uh, and they'll be able to soon, let's say within a month, soon start um, signing up for classes, like you know they signed up for the Zoom class right here. That's cool. I love yeah. that idea. <laughs> yeah, they're about an you know about an hour, an hour and fifteen minutes long is what we're thinking right now, um, and they'll be from very simple, straightforward things to some things a little bit more complex. And we'll just see what people really want to you know what, where they want to go with it. Sure. I just love to teach and share my fascination for um, for food and being self taught. I know how it feels to not know, and I want people to get that um, sense of empowerment by taking the classes and, and, you know, by raising their hands and I'll be able to answer their questions. I'll be wearing earbuds. And so we can talk during the middle of it. That's awesome. So what are your favorite food combinations these days? 
You know, I, um, <laughs> you know, it's not, I, it's not so much as in, in, in specific ingredients. It's, it's really the, what I'm attracted to is food that remains fascinating as you're eating it. So, hmm. you know, acidity is really important to me. I mean, I could say um, fish sauce and extra virgin olive oil and um, well, some of the standbys are always interesting to me. Cumin, black beans, plantains, pineapples, mangoes, um, the local Florida seafood always is going to be interesting to me. But it's that interplay between fat, acid, meatiness, um, aspects of what might be found in bread or rice or pasta, you know, that kind of plainness that potatoes, plainness that helps you kind of bridge between uh, richness and acidity and spiciness. I love spiciness. <laughs> so do you have, do you have a rule of thumb that you go like, if you're adding this or that or the other thing, do you have a rule of thumb that guides your, you know, the, my, my rule of thumb would be balance and it has to be memorable. I, I, I a very, very um, incredibly what would I say? Intimidating French woman came to uh, visit me in a kitchen back in my Miami Beach days around 92, brought there by a Miami journalist, Carol Kotkin being the journalist, and Carol became a great friend over time. Uh, she brought in a woman named uh, Colette Rosant, who I believe is still alive and must be about 100 years old. I spoke to her daughter not too, too long ago, and she was still alive and living in France. Anyway, Miss Rosant came and visited us. She was kind of on a, you know, a journalist uh, track to find out where in Miami she should tell her viewership to go, her readership to go. And Carol said, you need to come and check out Norman Van Aken's food. He's, he's doing something really different with our flavors. And so she came, it was afternoon and, and normally in the afternoon, you're really not ready to do something like that, but I made a, uh, a special case for her because I, I wanted her to, uh, to know what I was doing and I respected Carol. So I made her a dish and I don't recall what the dish was. And she said, you know, that was really very good, but I won't remember it. And I was crushed. I was like, oh my oh, gosh, no. that was my chance. And I blew it and I was like, wait, wait, okay. Can you stay like just five more minutes, please stay. And she kind of like put her bag back down on the table and she says, okay. Cause she told, she could tell I was just, I was really <laughs> not wanting her to leave. And so I made a, um, a dish called my down Island French toast with foie gras. And it was really, you know, it was really kind of like a unique dish. And um, at the end of it, and I went back out to the table. I was now almost like, you know, what, like one of those shows like Top Chef or somewhere. I was the one, my knees knocking. And I, and I just looked at her and said, did you like it? She goes, no, I didn't like it. I loved it. You've created a memory for me. I'll never forget. And so it is that. It's, it's not enough for me to feed people. I want them to have memories that last forever. That's my goal. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Um, I wanted to just touch, I, were, I know we're going to be out of time in just in a little bit, and I want to take some questions from the audience too, but I wanted to ask you about the fact that you're the only chef in Florida's history to receive the James Beard Foundation, who's who in American food and beverage. How do you feel about that honor? Blown away. Um, we touched on the, on the fact that the first book I bought um, when we were speaking earlier on this, the first book I ever bought was by James Beard. I dedicated, I dedicated Feast of Sunlight to James Beard. Um, he was an American uh, who loved America's flavors. Um, when the James Beard Foundation got started, and it didn't start, I don't believe there was any there were any awards until around ninety two or so. Um, it was uh, it was. It was like this amazing thing for chefs to come together. Chefs, cookbook authors, winemakers, uh, artisanal food producers. Um, the James Beard Awards became and now are universally thought of as the Oscars of the food world. Um, so to I won the, it was called the Best Chef Southeast before they changed regions. I won that. Now, now for Miami, it's called Best Chef South. 
But then when I received the, um, the James Beard Who's Who, of which only five people in the country received that in, in a year, um, that was, I don't know, that was mind blowing. I love it. That's great. Um, are and, I, there... and I would not have received it had I not, uh, have, had I not showcased the flavors of our state, Florida. And the reason that, that I received that recognition, I'm positive of it, is because of the clarity and the intensity of the vision of wanting to showcase Florida. Still, it still needs to be showcased more. There are some young chefs coming up, which get it, and I admire them, and I, and I'm, I'm really happy that um, more chefs are, are going after it in the same with the same intensity that um, I dedicated my professional life to. So, uh, have you passed this um, passion for cooking on to your to your kids? <laughs> Our son and Justin, our only our only son, our only child, uh, he okay. loves to cook. Yes, he does. Um, and we cook like you know, he did the cookbook with me. He right. loves to cook. He he learned pastry. He, you know, when he first came into working in our kitchens, he was sophomore in high school, and I think he wanted to get to the other side of the kitchen where I wasn't, <laughs> <laughs> so he could he could learn without dad being right in his pocket. You know. <laughs> um, so you mentioned. Um, restaurants before that do you have any restaurants currently that are open that are yours or that you're working on yeah uh not open because we're moving the normans that has been at the ritz for uh 16 years is now moving over to sand lake road uh in the delagio plaza and we hope to be open by um thanksgiving that's up in Re orlando, reopen right in orlando, orlando right yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I've got something else that's cooking down here, but um, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag or jinx it. So we'll talk about that next time. <laughs> OK, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat box that people are asking um, for some cooking tips so far. Sure. And if anyone else before we close out in a few minutes, if you have any questions or comments, please throw them in the chat box and we'll make them known. But Colleen wants to know, how do you caramelize the plantain? Plantain, well, plantain. I, if either way, either way. I mean, <laughs> you know, my son laughs at my Spanish because he grew up in Florida, so he thinks I'm pretty bad. But uh, plantains, plantains, platanos, you know, I I know them all and pronounce them all different ways depending. But um, the key thing, you said, Colleen. Yes, Colleen. The the key thing um, for doing them to where they are going to be sweet. Uh, what they're called maduro plantains. You want them to become fully ripened. Plantains also called the cooking banana because they can be eaten raw, but they barely ever are. And for good reason, they're just not as enjoyable. So um, if you buy the plantains and you're in kind of a hurry to serve them and they're not dark yet, put them in a grocery bag and fold with the grocery bag because the gas that is natural part of the component of the plantain releases, but kind of becomes trapped inside that bag and helps accelerate the ripening process. So a ripe plantain is key. And then the next things are just simply, um, typically they're seasoned with salt, pepper, and sometimes a little bit of cinnamon to accentuate the sweetness. Sometimes sugar is added too. Um, the ones that I did today, I didn't use sugar, but I used a salt, pepper, and cinnamon, and then I cooked them in whole butter. And then I put them in an oven at 300 degrees for about 20 minutes. The time will change, will be dependent upon um, the ripeness of the plantain. So keep an eye on it. Always can take it out, peek at it, and then take another look. I love the part that you talked about whole butter. Yes, whole butter. Um, okay. Frank wanted to know how long you boil shrimp for shrimp cocktail. Right. Um, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to, cr cr it's going to be very affected by how much uh liquid you've got in the pot how much shrimp you're trying to cook um it's not as dramatic as say the amount of the ratio between pasta and pasta water but i like to have a fair amount of you know liquid in the pot and uh, so what i'll do is i'll make a shrimp boil with the shrimp shells beer and water and um and then i'll bring that to a good high simmer just under a boil i'll have some like uh some spices in there or some old bay is always an easy one to get a lot of spices in there. One, some onion, beer, lemons, 
and that have been quartered up and then um, drop the shrimp in there. And once the shrimp returns to almost a boil, take one out, cut it in half in the thick part, take a quick peek. If it's not cooked, let it go another 30 seconds and then you should be good. Thank you. Um, I think it's also Frank who wants to know how to prepare a chicken consomme. That is an interesting and laborious task. You will want to, you know, I, I'm too advanced in years, I guess, to have learned the way so many of the young people learn today on YouTube. I learn on YouTube also. Like if I can't figure out some silly thing, like why I can't, blow up an air mattress or something. I've found that <laughs> YouTube's got all that stuff there. So right. uh, I was a book buyer and book learner. So I would probably go to Jacques Pepin's La Technique, which is right over there and see how the great master would do it. Um, but Jacques does lots of videos on uh, on his website too. And I'm in the newest, uh, the newest Jacques Pepin video cookbook, which just came out this year. And you should all hopefully, if you love Jacques and I hope you do, um, check that out and check out his foundation because um, they're up for a, a, one of these new Webby awards. But oh. to to get to get to consomme means you've got to take you know you've got to take the laborious steps of making a stock, and then you've got to make the um, the elements that create what are called what's called the raft, which you kind of create this kind of almost looks like I don't know like a filter that lays on top of the barely simmering stock. And then you create a little hole in that. And through this magic of circulation, the solids that are be in the stock get trapped in the raft. Eventually you clear away that raft and then you end up with this beautifully clear consomme. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> uh, does anyone else have any questions, comments you wanna you wanna throw at us before we um close it out. I've got like 5 million questions, but I'm not supposed to be hogging the show here. Although I would like to ask you if you have a favorite dish, what's your favorite dish to prepare? <laughs> Something I've never made before would be my answer. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. What's your favorite thing to eat? What do you like to eat? <laughs> I like everything. You know, I, I, I mean, I'm not one of those persons like, you know, Andrew Zimmerman that would eat, you know, I have newt or something. I'm not interested in that kind of eating, but um, I applaud him for his humor and his, his <laughs> intelligence. Um, he's a great guy. But I, I mean, as long as something's made well, I'm definitely, you know, I'm down with that. I'm ready to go. I I never prepared yellowtail roe until the other day. One of my suppliers, um, Johnny, his, his, his business is called Johnny Oyster. He came by with to yellowtail form, maybe he said, chef, I don't know if you've ever made the row before, which is like shad row row. And I'm like, holy cow, I, all these years of cooking yellowtail never have. So I, I uh, chatted up um, a buddy of mine who's a chef in Key West and his father was a Key, uh, Key West fisherman. I said, do you guys ever cook the row from the yellowtail? He goes, oh, wow. Yeah. I haven't cooked it in years, but my dad used to cook it. And so I cooked some up the other day. It'll, I'm actually going to post it on my Instagram um, feed this week sometime. All so right, I that's that. something to look forward Not to. Not my favorite thing <laughs> in the world. I don't know. I, you know, I love simple things. I, you know, I love pizza. I love ribs. I like burgers. I like, you know, I like boiled shrimp. I like, you know, I'm, I, I don't look down my nose at everyday foods. Awesome. Well, you're very approachable and informative and fun. And this was such a great talk. And okay, you guys sitting out there, this is your last chance to ask the chef a question before we, before we say goodnight. Anybody, this is your chance. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> Well, you can find him, check out his, his um, Facebook page, check out his YouTube. Yeah, are you on YouTube? I am not as, uh, not as vigorously though as Instagram. Instagram is where I pretty much am doing most of my posting right now. And my website, which is where you can go back and look at uh, so many things, recipes, my, my radio shows, they're all there. My and cooking class information will be there too. Are you still, oh, there is a question from Caitlin. Are you still planning to open your cooking, a cooking school, like physically? At this I point, 
No, at this point, I'm going to focus on the virtual because I can reach people from all over. You know, there's no limit. I can, I'm not going to probably, you know, see people from 10 time zones away, but I, I certainly can see people from New York and Chicago being able to attend. Sure. And that's, that's sure. cool. And if there's anyone in the audience who does not know how to use Instagram and doesn't know how to create an Instagram account, you know, the library offers classes and stuff like that, and they're all free. So if you want to follow Shelf on Instagram, but you're not sure how, come see us or give us a call and we'll help you get you all set up. OK, keep us in mind. Yeah, that. please do. Check it out. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us, for being part of our Florida Foodways. It's been awesome. And I wish you the best of luck in all of your endeavors in the future. And I hope that we can have you back again. And my pleasure. You're not that far away. So maybe we can do an in-person program sometime once things calm down a little bit. So. Um, well, we're fully vaccinated, so we're 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 excited about doing a little bit of travel. We're finally going to do a tiny bit of travel, go to a, a wedding in July. So we're excited about that. Baby steps sounds great. Yep. Thank you so much, Chef, again for everything. I appreciate it so much, and thank you to everyone for being here. And I hope we'll see you again um, in week three, which is next week. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everybody.